Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this is Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. In this uh, video, we're going to look at Chapter 5 of our textbook on middle childhood, the fourth section on personality development in middle childhood. Uh, one of the things we first want to you know, really just talk about before we even get to the other slides is really about personality and has a lot to do with identity, and that is who a person uh, feels that they are. And one of the simplest ways of assessing identity is with something called the 20 statements test. And what it is, is a person has to write 20 statements or sentences uh, that answer the general question, who am I? Uh, and the way you do this, you say, I am this, I am that, I am whatever. And, you know, what's interesting about it is you tend to find some gender differences and you find some cultural differences. For instance, uh, women are more likely to mention their gender than men are. Also, women are more likely to mention some relational terms about being, you know, a sister, daughter, cousin than than uh, boys and men are. And um, one of the interesting things is that uh, people from collectivist countries like Japan or China or India or uh, a lot of traditional cultures also are more likely to qualify their responses. I am this way when I am with this group. Um, whereas Americans, for instance, who are highly individualistic, like to say, I'm always this way, no matter where I am or who I'm with. Anyhow, let's take a look at some theories of personality development, middle childhood. So the first one's Freud, we're going to talk about now. Freud, of course, has his psychosexual stages, the, you know, from the oral stage early on to the anal, to the phallic, uh, to latency. And according to Freud, children in middle years, the group we're talking about right now, are in the latency stage where sexual feelings remain repressed or unconscious. And again, mostly what he's talking about is the source of sensory gratification uh, that early on it's the mouth and the anus then the phallus, you know, whatever. But he says here it sort of isn't there. Um, on the other hand, Eric Erickson, his student who talked about um, uh, psychosocial development, talked about the middle childhood stage as being one of industry versus inferiority, which has a whole lot to do with going to school. And that children who are able to master the challenges of their middle years, which will primarily involve achievement in school, they develop a sense of industry and that they're able to accomplish things, uh, sort of competence and self-assurance. Um, also, social cognitive theory, another major theory of development and personality, talks about the importance of rewards and modeling in middle childhood. And that during these years, children depend less on external rewards and punishments. So, you know, again, they're not around their parents as much. They're, they're going off to school now. And instead, they increasingly regulate their own behavior. So there's this internalization of a lot of what's going on. Now let's look at another very wordy chart. Uh, this is uh, from Selman's uh, perspective-taking skill. Now, social cognition refers to the perception of the social world, or really just thinking about people in general, and it's related to perspective-taking because it's a cognitive advance that affects the child's social relationships. So during, for instance, Jean Piaget's concrete operation stage, egocentrism, really seeing things from literally your perspective, that declines and a, a child's ability to view the world from others' perspective expands. And so here we have Selman's perspective level. It says level zero, three to six, basically you're egocentric and don't even realize that people have other perspectives. Five to nine, the child says, yeah, other people might see things differently, but they're wrong. Um, and so they feel that there's only one correct way to see things. And then you, you know, again, level two, you see that there are different values and that uh, in level three, that everybody, you consider several viewpoints all at once, and, and, and so on. Anyhow, it all has to do with this gradual decentration or move away from egocentric thinking. Also, self-concept. Uh, we have an important issue here, and that's helplessness. A lot of kids um, don't really feel like failures at things until they go to school and they start getting bad grades. It's, you know, because up to that point, it may be that the parents have just been all positive and supportive, but also the tasks have been very different that they've needed to do. And we have something called learned helplessness is very important here. Learned helplessness was originally conducted with dogs. I've, I've described this before, where they would put a dog in a cage. It had two sides and a small wall, a small sort of fence in between the two that the dog could jump over. Dog would be on one side, a 
light would flash in the cage and then an electric current would come through the floor and the dog would jump over the fence to get to the other side and get away from the electric current. That's good. It's, it's, it's learned how to deal with this problem. However, the researchers would then make it so that when the dog jumped over, both sides of the floor had an electric current. And so the dog simply could not ex escape the shock. Now, what happened, though, is that the dogs would eventually just cower and they would, you know, really just buckle down and just take the pain. The problem, aside from being a horrible thing to describe, is that the researchers would then turn off the electric uh, floor on the other side, but the dogs had decided that they couldn't escape it, so they wouldn't even try to escape anymore. That is, they became helpless and it was trained in them by having this time period which was finite. It only lasted so long, but there was this time period during which their actions could not produce the desired results. And so they became, they learned or acquired helplessness. The same thing can happen with children. So for instance, you have the acquired belief that you're unable to obtain the rewards that you're looking for. So helpless children, for instance, tend to quit following a failure. They don't, they just stop trying. Whereas children who believe in their own ability tend to persist or change their strategies and keep trying. And this is often reflective of one's confidence in his or her own, own abilities. It's also going to be reflective of your theories about is, is this ability is just built in. You either have it or you don't. And if you don't have it, well, if you don't have it, then why try? As opposed to the idea that you can, you can develop and acquire these things even if you didn't sort of come with it natively. Okay, uh, a few things about behavioral problems. Number one, uh, we got young kids here smoking, drinking, and uh, using substances. So conduct disorders are a major issue. So conduct disorders often emerge by eight years of age, and this is when kids begin stealing, lying, uh, they become truant, uh, cruel to animals, they fight. And so by definition, these children, the ones with conduct disorders, persistently break rules or violate the rights of others. Uh, and conduct disorders are more common in boys than girls, except there is one interesting thing. Girls are more likely to, uh, for the truancy than boys are. Um, they can be involved in sexual activity before puberty, as well as drink, smoke, and uh, substances. And again, things like Utah let us know about the prevalence of the abuse of prescription drugs, things that are available in the house, like painkillers. Um, also, people with uh, conduct disorders have usually their academic achievements below grade, uh, below grade level, even when their intelligence is at least average. Many uh, kids with conduct disorders also have ADHD. They have both genetic and environmental causes, such as deviant peers and inconsistent discipline from their parents. There's a tendency also not to take personal responsibility for their actions. Instead, many children see their problematic behaviors as reasonable reactions to external factors or somebody else made me do it, it's not my fault. And that is, they show a very, so often a selective external locus of control or external attributions for their own problematic behavior. Another group of problems that uh, comes up is depression. And Somewhere between 5 and 9% of children are seriously depressed in any given year. And depressed children, they can experience a lot of the same symptoms as adult depression, such as poor appetite, insomnia, lack of energy, crying, hopelessness, helplessness, and even thoughts of suicide in middle-aged children. Now, men, because many children don't recognize depression in themselves until you know at least age 7, it's often inferred from behavior such as withdrawal from social activities. It's got both biological and psychological causes, and it can be a complex disorder to treat. And often, therapy will work well if it's done in a family or social setting, because that has so much influence on how the child's uh, world works. Also, we have here a school phobia and a separation anxiety. So children show various forms of anxiety disorders, and these can include generalized anxiety disorder uh, without depression, but they can also include specific phobias, such as, well, you can have separation anxiety disorder, sometimes called SAD, not to be confused with seasonal affective disorder, but separation anxiety disorder, uh, or stage fright. Um, and so separation anxiety disorder, that's diagnosed when separation anxiety is persistent, it's excessive, it's inappropriate for the child's developmental level, interferes with other activities, such as attending school. Anyhow, there's more to be said on this, but that's where we're going to stop for this particular section.